thank you all very much for being here today. 52 years is a long time, and what we're doing today, as Nicola just said, is something a little different and a little special. It's uh, what I hope will be an engaging potpourri of photographs, new and familiar, uh, home movies, oral histories, but what will really make this day special are these two microphones at either end of the stage, because periodically throughout this uh, chronological exploration of November 22nd, 1963, I'll be asking some of you to come up and share your own memories very briefly about where you were when you learned of the assassination and what this event meant to you at the time and what it means to you today, uh, over half a century later. We're going to be looking at uh, a number of photographs today, and we're going to start our journey actually uh, in Fort Worth the night before uh, November 22nd, so Thursday, November 21st. But I want to start with this one picture uh, because it's the picture we've actually been using to promote this program over the last few weeks, and I think it really exemplifies the whole idea of moments and memories. Look at this wonderful picture, and believe it or not, this is a picture we've never used before, and it's rarely, if ever, seen. Uh, for, for most of you, I would imagine, this is the first time you're ever seeing this image, which I hope is uh, characteristic of, of the entire presentation today, but look at this moment. Uh, this is outside the Hotel Texas in Fort Worth on November 22nd, 1963, that morning about uh, 8.45 or so, and so less than four hours before President Kennedy will be uh, assassinated. But this wonderful moment between this elderly woman who, if you look at his arm there, look at how <laughs> forcefully she's gripping the president's arm there, um, and, and the way that the president is looking at her, there in the midst of this crowd of thousands of people outside the Hotel Texas, they're sharing a personal moment. I would love to know who this lady is. I would love to know her story. I imagine she's not with us anymore, and that's one of the things we'll talk about today, but the passage of time is something that we constantly fight in chronicling the history and legacy of this extraordinary event. But I love this picture, and I hope that you like it as well. And the person who took this picture is a Fort Worth photographer named Gene Gordon. Uh, Gene was the chief photographer of the Fort Worth Press at the time of the assassination. And last year, the museum was very fortunate to acquire over 400 photographs that Gene took uh, that weekend, uh, both uh, uh, that morning at the Hotel Texas, also at the breakfast that followed, and um, uh, the night before at Carswell Air Force Base, and also Lee Harvey Oswald's funeral that Monday. An extraordinary collection of pictures, and several of these I'm going to be sharing at the start of this program were taken by... Mr. Gordon. So let's go back to Thursday, November 21st, 1963. This is about 11 p.m. Uh, on Thursday night, and this is at Carswell Air Force Base waiting for the president to arrive. And we don't often see pictures or film from Carswell the night before, because as you can see in this very rarely seen picture. Look how dark it is. Um, the lighting at Carswell wasn't that great, um, but, th but there's such an extraordinary crowd. Look at all of these people, many of which are uh, the family and friends of Carswell personnel from the base. But in this picture, um, there's a couple of poignant things I want to point out. One, of course, you can't miss this Kennedy in 1964 sign, which uh, sadly never happened, but um, there's an entire uh, cottage industry of what might have been had had Kennedy uh, survived that assassination attempt and gone on to uh, seek re-election the following year. But something else I want to point out, look at the skyline of Fort Worth, visible in the background here. Notice how the buildings are illuminated uh, in this photograph here. Those are Christmas lights, specifically because it's a black and white picture. These are amber colored Christmas lights. And uh, Fort Worth put these across 62 buildings downtown. And typically that is a, a, a festive thing they do at Christmas time only, but they decided to do it so that President Kennedy, as he made his approach to Fort Worth in the dark that night, would be able to see the city. And uh, it's a wonderful little detail that you don't often see, but I, I think it's terrific to see the outline of, um, of Fort Worth there in the darkness at Carswell. Here's another picture you rarely ever see because the president's not in it. It's just the faces of the folks at Carswell. And it's another one of those pictures where I always like to look at the facial expressions uh, because it tells us so much about the pictures. There's a lot of anticipation, a lot of boredom also because the president hasn't arrived yet. Uh, and they're probably wondering why this photographer, again, Gene Gordon of the Fort Worth Press, is taking their picture. Uh, a couple details here. Of course, you have the classic Welcome Mr. President sign that you'll see again at Love Field the next day. Also, you have this sign, NT 
NTSU Young Democrats. Anybody know what NTSU means? There you go. I think we have a local audience here today. North Texas State University. Now, it became North Texas State University in 1961. Prior to that, it was uh, North Texas State College, so the initials would have been different had this picture been taken a couple years earlier. Uh, another sign I love here is this Welcome to Texas Jack and Jackie sign. We actually, uh, and, and the T is a longhorn. You might not be able to see the detail of that. But uh, we have one of these in our collection. They were actually commercially produced and sold at Carswell. And again, the next day, um, uh, an entrepreneur who decided to make some really nice Kennedy signs uh, was selling them out there. And we have one in our collection. And since this is a black and white picture, you can't really appreciate the detail. But this is sparkly red glitter. And uh, if you go on our website, we have an extraordinary online collections database where you can really browse through some extraordinary films and photographs and artifacts, and you can see uh, that sign, uh, one uh, in taken a, a, photo, a color photograph of that sign, and you can see the red glitter there as well. All right, so the Kennedys, this is about 11 o'clock. The Kennedys arrive, and they begin to disembark Air Force One at 11.15. They finally get settled at the Hotel Texas right around midnight. Uh, but this is a great picture, again, one that you rarely ever see from Carswell that night. Uh, but here we have, of course, Mrs. Kennedy, who's just accepted a bouquet of roses, the president. Here we have Fort Worth Congressman Jim Wright, who was sort of hosting the president during his uh, stay in Fort Worth and also traveled with the party aboard Air Force One the next day. In fact, a little trivia question I often get asked is who sat next to John F. Kennedy on that very last plane ride, that 15-minute flight from Fort Worth to Dallas, and it was Congressman Jim Wright, who very sadly we lost earlier this year. And here we have uh, Governor of Texas John Connolly, uh, and then we have the First Lady of Texas uh, Nellie Connolly as well. So again, a classic picture taken by Gene Gordon that Thursday night. And uh, the reason we don't see all of these Thursday uh, Thursday night pictures is because so many great pictures were taken the very next morning around 8.45 when the president and uh, his entourage went outside to the parking lot of the Hotel Texas for that uh, morning, morning speech there. And here you see a wonderful picture of President Kennedy with uh, Governor Connolly peeking over his shoulder here. And I believe that's Don Kennard, a state senator at the time. So again, we're talking less than four hours before the motorcade passes through Dealey Plaza, which gives a special meaning, a special poignancy to a picture like this. The president went out in the crowd that morning to greet people. Now, we've seen pictures of the president outside the Hotel Texas that morning, but I bet you haven't seen this one because if you look closely, President Kennedy is slightly blurry in this shot, and there's so many pictures uh, taken outside the Hotel Texas that this is one, because he's slightly out of focus, you don't see. But instead of focusing on President Kennedy, look at all the faces of the crowd. Uh, it really does give you a sense of what a what a pop star Kennedy was. He was such uh, an iconic figure. These people are so excited the way many of them might be the following year when the Beatles come to America. But Kennedy did um, usher in sort of a new age of ce celebrity politicians. Uh, of course, Kennedy was the first president born in the 20th century. He was the youngest man ever elected president. And his predecessor, Dwight Eisenhower, who had been a World War II general, was the oldest president in American history at that time. So the Kennedys offered something new and dynamic, and I think it is characterized by a wonderful, rarely seen image like this one. Another picture of the crowd, and this one I'm not sure has ever been published before. Again, President Kennedy's not in this picture, but look at the rapt attention of these folks as President Kennedy is briefly speaking to them outside the Hotel Texas. Look at the, these faces here. And it was a rainy morning, so you see some folks in hats and, and little rain ponchos there. But I want to show you something else in this picture. We have in this one little vertical frame, one, two, three cameras in the crowd. Where are those pictures? Where are those pictures today? Wouldn't it be amazing to see what these people at different vantages in the crowd took with their color home movie cameras, their color amateur still cameras, even if they're slightly out of focus, the rich detail these pictures can provide. And that is one of the most 
frustrating and tantalizing things about being at this museum. You never know who's going to show up with a dusty shoebox, uh, pictures that have been stashed away in an attic or a closet uh, or a garage for over 50 years. But uh, to date, we have not identified these particular photographers. So maybe if we all gather together in a couple years, we'll be able to share some of these pictures. But uh, since this is going to go out on YouTube, let this be a call to action for folks that have any pictures from the trip to Texas to please share them with our museum so that we can continue to construct a more uh, personal and dynamic portrait of November 22nd, 1963. Now this next picture is again one that you never see because look at the, look at the angle. This is taken from a slight elevation. Um, there's President Kennedy speaking to the crowd and you get a, a real sense of the, uh, the, the logistics of the Fort Worth uh, parking lot speech here. There's the crowd behind the barricade with all the law enforcement officials there. Look at the number of umbrellas in the crowd because it's still slightly misting and drizzling there. Um, let me also point out all the raindrops gathered on the podium here. Uh, that's something that you ne never think about. And all those close-up shots of the president standing at the, uh, at the podium that day, it's hard to imagine that he's standing there without notes, speaking off the top of his head, and his podium is just covered in rain. And it's extraordinary. There's Jim Wright again right there, Raymond Buck, who hosted the Chamber of Commerce breakfast inside. And uh, again, in this crowd, there's so many faces, so many untold stories we would love to capture. But in this picture, which, which I actually saw for the first time uh, less than a year ago, I noticed one person in this crowd who, who I recognized. And there he is, right there, uh, circled in yellow here in this picture. And that is actually actor Bill Paxton, uh, who you probably recognize from a number of movies like Titanic and uh, Twister and Apollo 13. Uh, Bill was out there as an eight-year-old Fort Worth native that morning, uh, sitting on someone's shoulders in the crowd, as you can see. They're actually a stranger's shoulders because uh, his dad was holding up his brother. So a stranger was holding up Bill, young Bill, eight-year-old Bill, on his shoulders uh, for this picture. Um, we, we found Bill years ago in some um, news footage, but this is the first, this is the only picture that we know of that actually shows President Kennedy and young Bill Paxton in the same frame. What, what, a, what a great picture. And to give you a closer look at Bill in the crowd, there he is. This is some uh, news footage taken by Roy Cooper at, at local station KTVT, but there he is. And we did an oral history with Bill Paxton a few years ago, and I'm going to ask him to narrate uh, the next little bit. Tell us what that morning meant to him. The president came out. It was like seeing a movie star. For me, for the first movie star, but I mean, a real leading man movie star. He, he, was, he seemed tan. He was very jocular. I remember his opening comment was something about to the effect that Jackie I was so he was sorry that Jackie wasn't out here to greet you good people. She takes a little longer to get ready, but she looks a heck of a lot better. I don't remember verbatim what he said, but it was something like that. It, it you know it loosened the crowd up. There was humor. There was laughter. Yeah. So now we're going to follow Gene Gordon and his camera from the parking lot of the Hotel Texas into the uh, Grand Ballroom. And this was a breakfast hosted by the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce, and President Kennedy spoke about. 9.25 in the morning, so the assassination at this moment is only three hours away. This was his last public speech, and he uh, said, uh, rather prophetically perhaps, as a part of his uh, prepared speech that morning, he said, we would like to live as we once lived, but history will not permit it. Now, Gene took a number of pictures at the Fort Worth Breakfast, uh, many of which have been published, including this one, but there's some others that I find really interesting, and I want to share a couple of those with you. This is a great one here. Uh, it, it's something of an awkward picture, because you can see uh, F First Lady of Texas, Nellie Connolly, is sort of in the process of either standing up or sitting down, so she's standing a little awkwardly, and Lady Bird Johnson kind of has a, a strange expression on her face, and Governor Connolly is chewing, unfortunately, in this picture, but it's a wonderful kind of candid shot uh, of the head table there. And you see uh, Senator Ralph Yarborough there on the end, on the far left here. But there's a detail about this picture that I want to uh, point out, and that is Vice President Lyndon Johnson is wearing glasses. And that is something you rarely saw in a photograph. In fact, uh, at least when he was Vice President in the early 1960s, Lyndon Johnson hated to have his picture taken wearing glasses uh, and typically he had a reaction like he has in this next photograph I'm about to show you and uh, 
this was taken by Dallas <laughs> Times Herald photographer Eamon Kennedy, and he's going to narrate this for us here. This is when he was vice president. He'd come in on a, a kind of a small jet, and he was carrying his, his shorts and his suit, you know, and hangers, and, but he's wearing glasses. He, he told me, don't, don't take pictures. I just kept taking pictures. So he finally walked over, and he said, what's your name? And I said, Kennedy. So he thought I was putting him on. And the reporter said, that's really his name. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hear a little bit more from Eamon later in the program today. But, uh, but I love this picture of Lyndon Johnson. And one of the things about this picture of Eamon's, in addition to Vice President Johnson wearing glasses, how often do you see the Vice President of the United States with his own garment bag, carrying his own luggage off the plane. Uh, for that reason alone, it makes this picture really special. So uh, that, little, that little anecdote aside, let's go back to the Fort Worth breakfast. Back to this picture because there's more to see in this hard, rarely ever seen picture, new picture. I want to call it a new picture, even though we're talking about a picture taken 52 years ago today. But still, it's a new picture to us, isn't it? So look at Johnson's plate. This is one of the best pictures of the actual Fort Worth breakfast uh, that was served that day. So you see there's some ham steak on his plate and some eggs and his potatoes. And why am I talking about the breakfast that morning? It's because President Kennedy was Catholic. And on Fridays, of course, the president would not have been allowed to eat meat. And so the ham served at this breakfast along with the ribeye that would be served at the trademark luncheon in Dallas and the, let's see, I want to make sure I get this right, the Kansas City Strip that would be served at the Austin Banquet that night. That's a lot of meat, uh, a cholesterol tour de force through Texas that he was going to be having on that Friday. And yet he was Catholic, so he would not be allowed to eat that meat. And so actually there was a story run in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram that morning uh, assuring readers that it was okay for the Catholic John F. Kennedy to eat meat on Friday because he had received uh, a special dispensation from the Catholic Church to eat meat on that Friday. And it, it, it's, it's funny to think about that today, but actually that happened very often during his years in the White House. It was extremely common for the president to get a dispensation from the Catholic Church anytime he had to attend a banquet or a special dinner on Friday, allowing him to eat meat. We're going to finish up the Fort Worth breakfast with this wonderful picture of Vice President Johnson leaning over to talk to John F. Kennedy. And, and you know, we, we hear so much about Lyndon Johnson and uh, how direct and, and almost um, um, how he didn't really have a sense of personal space. And I, I think it's really demonstrated well in this picture how he's sort of leaning over uh, into, uh, you know, President Kennedy's uh, seat there. But you have to wonder what they're talking about in this picture. I, I love this particular photograph. I don't see it very often, but it is such a neat picture uh, and the last one we're going to look at from Fort Worth. You know, I want to believe that maybe Johnson was not aware of the dispensation from the Catholic Church. and Maybe he's asking if he can have the president's <laughs> ham. I don't know. <laughs> and we, we do not know that for certain. But, you know, sometimes when you stare at hundreds and hundreds of pictures, things like that occur to you because you've got to wonder what the stories are behind all of these remarkable pictures. We're going to leave Fort Worth now, and we're going to pick up the story in a moment with the motorcade. But I want to take a moment to pause because... Uh, several times, as I mentioned throughout this program today, I want to ask our audience members to sh briefly share where they were on November 22nd, 1963 at these two microphones. And actually, I want to call on the first person special because Gene Gordon is actually here today. The wonderful Fort Worth Press photographer who took all these great pictures. Gene, stand up for us. Come Come on over to this mic for a second. We're so fortunate to have your pictures. One of the ones we looked at was the one taken from an elevation looking out into the crowd, the picture with little Bill Paxton in it. Um, there's a little story about how you got those particular pictures taken from that vantage point. Will you briefly tell us that story? Yes. I uh, Lean really close into the mic so we can hear you. I checked out the location for the parking lot speech early that morning, and I wanted this picture over JFK's shoulder. Uh, into the crowd, so I, I decided to go to my office, which was nearby, and I got an eight-foot step ladder and stashed it under the speaker's platform, uh, which was just a flat 18-bed trailer. Uh, and uh, when uh, I got the ladder out and checked it, as uh, people spoke earlier, 
uh, and it was going to be a great picture. So uh, uh, when JFK got up to speak, I, uh, I got the ladder out and climbed up and took that just that one shot, which was kind of disappointing. He wasn't turned enough uh, for the camera to see. Uh, but uh, after that one picture, a Secret Service guy jerked my pant leg and to get me down. And I said, what's the problem? I'm not going to shoot the president. Four hours later, he was shot. Thank you, Gene. Thank you yeah. so much. And thank you for all these wonderful pictures that we have uh, to tell this story. Um, we, we have time. There'll be other opportunities later in the program. But does anyone else want to just share a brief anecdote of where you were on November 22nd, 1963? Come over to either of our mics. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. We're just one big family here. Yeah. Okay, well, come right on up, sir, and, and just uh, just keep it brief and speak right into the mic, and we'd like to hear your story as well. Hello there. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, my name's Paul Nixon. I'm from England. I'm no relation to the former president. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah on, on that day, it's strange that Fort Worth came into it because I was watching TV. I was a 13-year-old boy, and um, after the, you know, there was a news flash, President Kennedy has been hit, da-da. And um, after um, they'd announced his death, they proceeded to broadcast a comedy program by Harry Worth, who you've probably never heard of. The BBC was heavily uh, criticized for that, yeah. And um, this, the following day is another strange coincidence. My hometown soccer team, Mansfield Town, were playing Oldham Athletic, and. After a minute's silence, they proceeded to kick hell out of each other. It's one of the dirtiest games I've ever seen. <laughs> and um, I was here on November the 7th for the Mary Pillsworth um, talk. And that very day, Mansfield Town were playing Oldham Athletic again. But um, yeah, I say it was, um, the, the thing was, you know, that really stuck in my mind was the rather tasteless um, playing of the Harry Worth Show, a comedy program after they just announced that, you know, that President Kennedy was dead. All right. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Nixon. Thank okay. you for sharing. There'll be, there'll be other opportunities, and we do have some other special guests in the audience as well, but let's, let's pick up with the program now in Dallas, and let's look at a brand new home movie. Uh, that's always exciting. So here we have an 8 millimeter silent film shot by a little Johnny Howler, who was 12 years old on November 22nd, 1963. He was a student at John J. Pershing Elementary School. And uh, Johnny and his mother went out to Turtle Creek Boulevard about an hour before the parade. This is the first time Johnny has ever used the family's 8mm home movie camera. And as you can see, he's extremely fixated on this plane that he thinks might be Air Force One, but sadly it is not. But we do get a wonderful extended view of that plane. And here comes the motorcade. Now Johnny, being 12 and a bit of a daredevil, decided that he was going to stand right in the middle of Turtle Creek Boulevard to see the presidential parade. And so in a moment we get this fantastic sequence uh, that you never see. Of the, He also shot this sequence because he thought these were Secret Service agents. They weren't. But look at this. Here comes the motorcade directly towards Johnny. He's standing in the middle of Turtle Creek, and imagine his mother, who was standing to the side, yelling at him, Johnny, Johnny, get out of the way. You're going to get run over. And a man even passes in front of his location. Uh, it's amazing that with such security that that happened. Here you see uh, the ticker tape and this wonderful glimpse as Johnny steps out of the road, back to the, back to the curb. You see the motorcade swing by, and you get that wonderful glimpse, very brief glimpse of the president and Jacqueline Kennedy. And then the motorcade continues on the twisty, turvy, twisty uh, curvy Turtle Creek Boulevard. Now Johnny, who, as I said, had never used a home movie camera before, was very reluctant to give it up. And so he decided to finish out the reel just shooting, as he described it in his oral history, stuff that was interesting. And so in, we're going to see just crowd shots. Again, he filmed the motorcade until it went completely out of view, and people actually began walking away. He liked the ticker tape there blowing in the breeze as traffic picked up again. Uh, again, cars stuck in gridlock traffic because the parade had just come by. And in a moment, he actually uh, took a brief sequence of a car full of military personnel uh, that he, again, thought was interesting. But a 12-year-old recorded this home movie 
which we did not see until he uh, brought it to our attention in 2013, just before the 50th anniversary, a new 50-year-old home movie. And this is the first time we have ever shared this publicly at our museum today. Here's those military personnel there. Now, you may notice that the quality of this home movie is sadly not that great. And there's actually a little story there which I hope will be a, a word of caution to folks who may still have original home movies in your collection somewhere. Uh, here's a comparison shot of a similar frame from John Howler's film here, and then the wonderful uh, home movie taken on Main Street by a fellow named George Jeffries. Uh, notice the distinction, the color difference between these two films. Notice the sharpness of the Jeffries film compared to the softness in the Howler film. And as you can see underneath, you can see what these films have gone through. So years and years ago, John Howler took his film to a facility that made 8 millimeter to VHS transfers. And often in those days, particularly in the mid to late 80s and early 90s, what a 8 millimeter to VHS transfer actually involved was actually showing the whole movie against a white wall and videotaping it with a home movie, with a, with a VHS camera, which of course delivered a much softer, sometimes sadly out of focus image. Uh, but that, but uh, unfortunately after that VHS transfer was made, uh, Mr. Howler got rid of his eight millimeter original. Then later on he had the VHS converted to DVD and he got rid of the VHS. Uh, and then the DVD in more recent years was shifted to a digital file, which is what I shared with you today. And uh, the DVD has either been disposed of or has gone missing. We don't know for sure. But all we have in our collection is the digital file. Now, compare that to the Jeffries film, which is a direct film to digital transfer. And you can really see the difference in quality. So please, if you have 8 millimeter home movies, whether or not they have anything to do with President Kennedy or the assassination, just for your own family's history, take care of those originals. And if you get them transferred digitally, keep your originals because they will always be uh, your best source material as technology changes over the years from, as we have seen, VHS to DVD to digital files. Now, I can't show you this wonderful frame from the Jeffries film without showing you the Jeffries film, but we've shown that so many times here. Uh, it was donated to us uh, years ago, uh, in fact, 2006, and it was made public in 2007, actually got worldwide media attention. But let's look at it in a different way today. We did an oral history with the late George Jeffries, who passed away last year in 2014, but we have his story preserved. So let us combine George's oral history as sort of a director's commentary on his film, and let's look at it in a new way. I went to work when I was 19 years old at uh, an insurance company, and, and I never changed jobs. I worked with it all my life. They, uh, it was Universal Life then, but eventually Southwestern Life bought us out. The Universal Life home office was on the corner of Ross and Lamar, and I walked from there right down to Main Street, which is just a few blocks. Yes, they were from my office. There were about six of them. I, I know one of them was Ann Lee McDaniel and uh, Ann Gooch. And uh, I, well, I, I think I remember them all. Mm -hmm. There were several of us in the office went up there, and like I said before, a man named uh, Charlie Nance had emphysema, and he couldn't. Wa I wanted to come down here to Dealey Plaza, and he couldn't walk that far, so we went over there to Maine in Padras, which is one block east of Lamar. I guess there were about four people deep on each, uh, on each side, and I got there in time to get right on the front. Oh, I was quite proud. Oh, I thought he was a good president, very much. I voted for him, as a matter of fact, and uh, I, I liked him real well. And I, we, I did not know he had been assassinated. See, when I left there, I walked back to work, and I didn't hear the sirens or anything. But in a little while, our switchboard operator called me and said her husband sets type for the Times Herald, and he said that uh, they were setting the type that the president was dead. And our president, William H. C was out at uh, Market Hall waiting for the, Mr. Kennedy to uh, give a speech. And when he got back to the office, he just missed, he, t he sent us home. He closed the office. It was almost like a dead city. See, I went back to the office after the president passed, but the next day at noon, I went down there and made a picture of the school book depository. When I went down there on Saturday, yeah, I, I did go to the office quite often on Saturday and work. <clears throat> well, I, I thought it was pretty historic. As a matter of fact, I would have been there had this man not been unable to walk, had been able to walk. All right. 
So a new way of looking at the George Jeffries film, and I, I hope to share some more uh, stories like that where we have images and we're able to gain so much more from these still or moving images through the, the spoken word of our storytellers. And speaking of familiar images, here is a picture which I'm sure all of you have seen at one time or another, uh, taken by 45-year-old Phil Willis in Dealey Plaza. And Phil, uh, who, who passed away back in the 90s, in addition to witnessing the Kennedy assassination, was a survivor of Pearl Harbor. And so if you can imagine being at those two historic moments at, in your lifetime. But this is an extraordinary picture which has gained a great deal of researcher interest over the years. I want to come back to this picture in a minute, but, but to set the scene, let's look at where Mr. Willis was that day. This, of course, is an early frame from the famous Abraham Zapruder film, and I'm going to circle Phil right there. So you can see uh, he's got one foot off the curb onto Elm Street, but he's on that south side of Elm Street taking pictures, looking towards the north side and the grassy knoll. You can see how close the president was to his position. Um, Mr. Willis took a number of famous pictures that day, some more famous than others. This is one that gets published sometimes, but it doesn't get published enough because it's out of focus, because the crowd in the background is a blur, the president is, is blurry. But this picture was taken a second or so before the assassination, if that, I mean, a fraction of a second. And Mr. Willis is only 15 feet from, from the presidential limousine at this moment. But, but even beyond that, the building you're seeing back there, do you know what that building is? That's the Texas School Book Depository. This is one of the only pictures taken that shows President and Mrs. Kennedy against the backdrop of this building here where, the, uh, where evidence was found shortly after the assassination. Another picture that Mr. Willis took, uh, this is actually the, the eighth in his sequence that day, if you, uh, if you know the Willis collection. But here is a scene taken about 30 seconds after the last shot is fired, and you have a number of people running. Uh, you can see the family, the Newman family, uh, beginning. Uh, they've, they've pushed their children to the ground. Uh, they're on the north side of Elm. Uh, you see quite a lot of activity in this picture. And one of the individuals running, in fact, dead center of this photograph, circled right here, is uh, actually Pierce Allman, who was the uh, uh, program director at WFA Radio. If you've toured the sixth floor either today or uh, at another time, Pierce is the gentleman that narrates our tour, one of the first media representatives inside the Texas School Book Depository. And this is a wonderful picture of him in the immediate aftermath of the assassination, running like so many other people did towards the uh, triple underpass area. Uh, in our new portraits exhibit, a collaboration with the Dallas Morning News, Pierce is one of our, our featured portraits. So please take a look at what Pierce Allman looked like here. In 1963, this is actually taken from his WFAA TV interview the day of the assassination, that picture, and go see what he looks like uh, 52, 52 years later in 2015. He actually hasn't aged that much. He looks remarkably good. Uh, another picture that Phil Willis took, and this is one that does not get seen very often, is this aftermath photo. The Willises, and this is uh, Phil and his wife Marilyn and their two daughters, uh, lingered in Dealey Plaza for over an hour with Mr. Willis just taking uh, color photo after color photo. And I like this picture because of the police presence here. You can just see this is the intersection of Elm and Houston. Okay, so we have the side of the Texas School Book Depository here, the side of the building. You can kind of make out a little bit of the fire escape there. And this over here is 501 Elm, which was the Dow Tex building at the time of the assassination, Abraham Zapruder's company, his dress manufacturing company, Jennifer Jr.'s, was in this building. Uh, but the fire truck is what really stands out, of course, the bright red fire truck, Dallas Fire Department. And there's actually a little story about the fire department that involves this floor where we are today, the seventh floor of this building. So a call went in to the Dallas Fire Department at 1.02 p.m. The assassination took place at 12.30, okay? So half an hour after the assassination, 1.02, a call goes into the Dallas Fire Department asking for firefighters to respond in a truck to the site of the shooting, corner of uh, uh, Elm and Houston. So fire truck arrives, as we see, and this is one of the only pictures I've ever seen with the fire truck uh, visible. But two firefighters, and their names were Leslie Warnock and Harry Coombs. They were brought into this building by investigators. The building had already been sealed off. They were beginning to search for evidence. The sniper's perch had been found in the southeast corner of the sixth floor. Ten minutes later, the Manlicker Kirkcano rifle had been found in the diagonally opposite uh, uh, northwest corner. But they didn't take the fire department officials to the sixth floor. They took them to this floor 
where we are right now, the seventh floor. And they had them bring a small ladder and, and a floodlight. And what they did was there was a false ceiling made up of pressed tin ceiling tiles that ran across the seventh floor. And it was dark, a dark, dusty warehouse space. And these investigators were concerned that the assassin or assassins may be hiding up in this area. They called it uh, the, the cock loft, which was essentially just an attic above a finished ceiling. And so this was the pressed tin ceiling, which you couldn't see up all the way to the, to the top of the building through the rafters as we can see today, because there was this false ceiling. And so they're using the, uh, the floodlights. They shined the lights up there, the fire department did, and they were able to determine there was no one hiding up in the, the cock loft of the seventh floor of the depository building. Now, here we are today. 52 years to the day later, and I want to share something with you. If you follow my beam of light way over there across the floor, a couple of those pressed tin ceiling tiles are still there. They're still visible all the way across the floor there. So when the program's over, go take a look at that. The building is an extraordinary historic artifact, and every nook and cranny of this building has a rich history behind it. But you can still see a little bit of that false ceiling. Now, where is the rest of that false ceiling today? Well, many of those uh, pressed tin ceiling tiles are in the collections of our museum, but a number of them were actually refurbished in the late 1970s, and they were taken down to the ground floor of this building. Uh, this building was purchased by Dallas County as part of a bond election in 1977, and for the entryway to the new Dallas County Commissioner's Court on the ground floor of the building, they took a number of the original seventh floor ceiling tiles, repurposed them, and they now form this lobby entrance space on the ground floor. So there's this uh, extraordinary history that all links back to that fire truck and those gentlemen who came into this building with floodlights that day to look for an assassin hidden on this floor. Now, back to Phil's most famous photograph, uh, a subject of, of, of rich research interest. Of course, you have the famous umbrella man who raised his umbrella in Dealey Plaza during the assassination. If you follow my beam of light there, there's that little dark spot, uh, human form there behind the retaining wall, which has taken on a great deal of research significance as the uh, black dog man figure, which has been discussed and debated about. But there's so many witnesses in this picture as well, people that uh, deserve to have their stories told. You've seen this picture, but I want to share it in a new light. Uh, I've taken a series of eyewitnesses that are visible in this picture and combined their oral histories to this picture. So for the next moment or two, let's, let's listen to a series of eyewitnesses tell us this moment in time when the first shot was fired, uh, what their experiences were. Phil Willis instinctively snapped this image when he heard the shot first shot fired. It was a reflex action. Having been in World War II, being a military man, the sound of gunfire triggered this reaction in Phil Willis to snap the shutter on his camera. So we have this remarkable moment frozen in time. And let's hear what the people in this picture have to say about this moment. You know, when that first shot went off, I thought it was a firecracker. We were down in the valley, and that, that echo when everything, you had to take consideration of what, where his head was and where the shot was coming from and everything. Two shots. It was, it was only two shots. Governor Connolly turned and looked toward the president. I thought he was shot, to tell you the truth, because the president was leaning over to, like he was going to listen to what Connolly had to say. And uh, Connolly was turning, turning his head to... Uh, talked to him, and when the president came back up is when the bullet hit him in the head. All right, Bobby Hargis, motorcycle officer there, uh, who, who apparently only heard two shots fired. Let's move on now to the next one. Uh, on the north side of Elm Street, gentleman wearing a hat, Ernest Brandt, and let's see how he describes this particular moment in time. Kennedy is right directly in front of us, and he's on our side of the, of the car. Now, I didn't see Governor Connolly. I didn't even see Mrs. Kennedy. I was so interested in seeing the president because he was closest. He was, it seems that as he approached us, he was casually waving to the crowd with his elbow on the side of the car and casually waving. I'm sure he was tired of waving the whole time, you know, and it was such a thin crowd to begin with there, and just casually waving. And then it seems that his arm went down just a few a second or two before the shot was fired. And while, when they were directly in front of us now, everything was fine. And the crowd was just buzzing normally like they would for any celebrity, I guess. And when he got about, oh, about 15 feet from John and I, we heard a loud report, a loud noise. 
Well, I was still looking at President Kennedy when I heard that report. Of course, I didn't recognize it as a shot. There was four motorcycle policemen, as you know, right at the tail of his car. And I saw, immediately, I saw his arms come up in this manner. I got rather frightened. My heart started pounding, and my adrenaline began to run about 900 miles an hour. And I thought, my gosh, somebody's shooting from somewhere, and I did not know where the shots originated. All right, and standing up on, on a little pedestal near the uh, colonnade was Marilyn Sitzman, who was a receptionist at Jennifer Jr.'s, worked with Abraham Zapruder, and her, her duty that day, because Mr. Zapruder had vertigo, was to steady him while he took one of the most famous home movies of the 20th century. And the first thing I remember hearing are what I thought was firecrackers, because Kennedy threw his hands up, and I heard bang, bang. Now, there could have been a third bang. I can't swear to that one. And it was way off to my left and above. And as they came down, the last shot that we heard was right in front of us. And it was like the same sound far off and to the left. So by this time, of course, I knew it wasn't firecrackers. No, neither one of us, neither yeah. Mr. Zapruder and I, turned ever. We kept our attention on what was happening exactly in front of us. And if you look at his film, there's very little jumping. It's steady, considering very, very what steady. was going on. And on the north side of Elm Street, on the extreme left of this picture, you see a little family with the wife bending down, two kids, and the husband and father there. And they are the closest civilian eyewitnesses to President Kennedy at the moment of the fatal shot, standing at that exact juncture on Elm Street where they witnessed it right in front of them. Bill and Gail Newman. Uh, my uncle, Steve Ellis, was a motorcycle officer, and he was leading the parade uh, through through uh, downtown. Uh, when I saw him turn the corner and come towards us, I leaned down and I said, oh, there's Uncle Steve, let's wave, and, and I'm sure that we all hollered his name and, and waved to him. You could hear the cheering of the of the crowd, and, and I can recall, uh, I bang, something like that. And actually, I thought someone had thrown a couple of firecrackers beside the president's car, and, I, uh, and the third shot rang out. And the side of his head blew off, and I turned to Gail, and I said, that's it, hit the ground. And we turned around, took our two children, and pushed them over on the grass and, and fell down on top of them. And finally in this picture, the... Uh closest eyewitness in so many ways, Secret Service agent Clint Hill, who jumped onto the back of the car during the assassination. I heard an explosive noise to my right rear. I had been looking to my left, so I scanned from my left to my right. When I did that, my eyes had to go across the back of the president's car, and I saw the president grab at his throat, so I knew something was wrong, something had happened. So I jumped from the car and ran toward the presidential vehicle. Now, I didn't hear any shot when I was running, but they tell me there was a shot at that time. But just before I reached the presidential vehicle, I heard another shot and I felt the results because the shot hit the president in the head to the upper right rear of his head above the right ear. The driver started to accelerate more. I slipped. I ran a few more feet, then got up on the car. About that time, Mrs. Kennedy was coming out on the trunk. She looked like she was reaching for something that had come off the right rear of the car from the president's wound. I helped her as best I could to get back into the back seat of the car. When she got into the back seat and sat down, the president's body fell to its left onto her lap. I noticed that his eyes appeared fixed. I assumed that it was a fatal wound. I turned, I gave the thumbs down to the follow-up car crew to let them know that this was a dire situation. Six unique perspectives from Dealey Plaza, all in this one photograph. There's so many stories, so many moments that uh, uh, defy exp uh, explanation. We have so many unique perspectives, and that's one of the, the problems with eyewitness accounts, but it's also one of the most meaningful as you look at the impact that the assassination had on these people who lived through these uh, extraordinary moments. Now, we have two. Kennedy assassination eyewitnesses here today with us, including one of our storytellers, Bill Newman. Bill, will you stand up so we can recognize you? Thank you. 
I don't know if there's anything more beyond what you just said that you'd like to share with us, but you, you are welcome to take the mic, if you will, in a moment. And we also have another one, three-year-old Ricky Chisholm, who is also on the north side of Elm Street. Ricky, where are you today? All right, Ricky Chisholm, three years old. Ricky, Ricky, come on up. We haven't heard from you today. You were with your parents uh, in Dealey Plaza, standing very close to the Newmans, actually. And after the shots were fired, an extraordinary thing happened to your dad. Tell us a little bit about uh, the aftermath and, and how it impacted your family. Speak directly into the mic there. Uh, well, right after the shots were fired, we were right before the Newman family. And right after the shots were fired, my dad took off running because he thought he'd seen somebody shooting from behind the fence. And uh, then we were, of course, taken to the police station, spent about 12 or 13 hours at the police station. But, your, but your dad was tackled in Dealey Plaza. Yeah. Tell us about that. He was that. tackled by the police. They thought he had maybe fired a shot. But he actually thought he'd seen someone running, so he took off running. And uh, then that's when we were all gathered up and taken to the police station. Spent about 12 hours, 13 hours at the police station. Then we were released. R Ricky, you were three at the time. This prompted nightmares, I know. What does yeah. it mean to you today, half a century later, uh, to talk about this moment? Well, I'm, I'm okay with talking about it now. For a long time, my family never discussed it. They were scared for some reason. But after my father died, um, I told my mother that we really needed to talk about what they seen, what happened. And so I guess within the last five years is when we really started talking about what we seen. I, I don't remember a lot, just the stories they told me and when I was young, I used to have nightmares about it and didn't know what it was. All I remember is a convertible car, and I thought it was a kid that had gotten shot, but it wasn't. Uh, after I was about 13 years old, my parents finally started telling me the stories of what happened. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you for being here today. Ricky's portrait is another in our special portraits exhibit, so be sure to take a look at that before you leave the floor today. I, I want to move us along here to Parkland Hospital. About six minutes after the assassination, the motorcade with uh, President Kennedy and Governor Conley arrive at the hospital, and this is the scene of Bedlam that you see here, a mix of folks that were at Parkland that day, medical students, nurses, uh, and reporters, and folks that just simply heard about the, the shooting and decided to go to Parkland to offer their support or just see what, what, what was going on at the scene. Now, a picture like this is extraordinary because there's so many faces and so many opportunities to collect uh, recollections of what was happening at the time. Now, if you'll notice the credit line here, this is the Dallas Morning News collection. Last year, the Dallas Morning News donated uh, over 1,500 negatives and 500 still images to help preserve local history and the global history of the Kennedy assassination and we are extraordinarily honored to have the Dallas Morning News collection here and I it's my great pleasure to share some of these pictures from the Morning News collection of Parkland Hospital. Now a picture like this it's hard to identify anybody but every so often we luck out. In this next picture we have three people that we are able to recognize uh, quite clearly. We have John Maziota, who was the chief photographer of the rival paper, the Dallas Times-Herald, and then standing next to him is Bob Jackson, whose name you might recognize uh, there at Parkland. Bob rode in the motorcade that day, actually saw a rifle extending from the southeast corner of the sixth floor. That camera he's got there was sadly out of film when he saw that rifle, and so he was not able to grab a photograph of it, uh, which he regrets, of course, to the present day, but 48 hours later, he more than redeemed himself when he captured the Pulitzer Prize winning photograph of Jack Ruby shooting Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. We have Bob's camera that captured that picture on display downstairs along with some other unique artifacts. And next to Bob, again, one more Dallas Times Herald photographer. This is Eamon Kennedy. We met Eamon earlier when he was um, annoying Lyndon Johnson, taking those pictures of Johnson with the glasses. There's Eamon. Eamon took some of the most iconic images at Parkland Hospital, this extraordinary picture right here, which is seen around the world. And you know, we don't know who these women are. I would love to play an oral history clip from one or both of these ladies, 
but we have never been able to identify them. So they, they remain um, unknown faces in the crowd at Parkland Hospital. Uh, another of Amon's pictures is this little girl. Now, we know this little girl. Her name is Kathy Atkinson. She was a 12-year-old student in Dallas, and she and her mom, and that's her mom standing next to her with the scarf over her head. They heard on the radio that President Kennedy had been shot, and Kathy went down, in her words, to peek in his hospital window and wave at him and tell him that the people of Dallas love him. And uh, this moment of tearful prayer and in this, in this high-resolution scan, you can actually see the tears in Kathy's eyes. This image... Uh, in so many ways represented, as it, as it says here, the grief of a nation. And it was spread around the world, and um, uh, Kathy became well-known. She was published initially as an unknown face, but fortunately through her mom, we were able, uh, the, the Dallas Times-Herald was able to identify her, and um, uh, we know who she is today. She did an oral history with the museum and sadly passed away much too young in 2013. But that is the exception to the rule, being able to pinpoint particular faces in the crowd. And there's such uh, important narratives told by these individuals that when we're able to find them. And it's frustrating when we see people, especially people that appear in more than one picture, and we don't know who they are. It's, it's a frustrating thing, but it's also tantalizing in the way that it, en it enables us to become historical investigators to try to find these people. So I just want to briefly go on a little historical mystery with you, and let's see if we can identify a couple faces in the crowd. Now, these two guys here and their friends standing behind them. Uh, there's a whole sequence of these pictures in the Dallas Morning News collection. And we don't know who they are. They're just these young men, and um, um, clearly something is going on because they're talking to reporters. The reporters are uh, writing down notes, but we do not know who they are. Now, this picture was taken by Tom Dillard, who was the chief photographer at the Morning News, outside the emergency entrance to Parkland. You can see the emergency entrance, the ambulance bay, so very close to where the motorcade was. Now, a photographic researcher named Richard Trask actually came across a print of this picture years ago, and um, he believed that this particular man with the camera was a fellow named Al Volklin, and Al Volklin took this extraordinary picture on Stimmons after the assassination. Al and his wife Lou were standing in the central median of Stimmons uh, facing southeast back towards downtown and one of these one of the most extraordinary things of course Al had no idea the assassination had taken place but he framed this picture so beautifully there's the Texas School Book Depository in the background framed perfectly just above the speeding motorcade as it makes its way to Parkland Hospital. So Richard Trask thought for, for quite some time that this young man with the camera, this unknown individual, may have been Al Volklin. But unfortunately, it just doesn't add up. Al and his wife, Lou, of course, were a couple, and yet we see this young man here with uh, a couple of young buddies. Clearly, he's part of a student group that went out to see the parade that day. Also, uh, Al and his wife, uh, Al Volklin and his wife, Lou, say that they were in Oak Cliff within 15 or 20 minutes of the assassination, not Parkland. So unfortunately, it's not Al Volklin. But there's just something going on in this picture, the way they're talking to reporters. And so let's see if we can use some of the clues in these pictures to discover who these guys are. So let's zoom in on a reporter's notepad to see exactly what he's writing down. So he says, Connolly rear seat... Uh, it looks like lying down with an arrow. So these guys clearly saw the limousine at such an angle or a juncture that they were able to see Connolly laying down in what he believed was the rear seat here. So we have these notes here, but that's, that's not all. One of these boys has actually got his own piece of paper here. So tweaking the contrast and blowing it up. Let's see the detail here. It's hard to read, but what we have here is Mac Kilduff and some details about him, Matt Kilduff being the assistant White House press secretary, not a universally recognized name at the time. And so why would this young man have Matt Kilduff's name on this little, looks like a pay stub, a piece of paper where he's quickly jotted it down? The only way he would have known Kilduff's identity, other than hearing it in the crowd, would have been to gain access to Parkland inside the nurse's classroom where the official announcement of the president's death was taking place. So the plot kind of thickens. We know they saw the motorcade in such a way that they were able to see the inside of the car and they know the identity of Malcolm Kilduff. And there's other things of note. We have this young man and he looks so young, younger 
than a reporter would be. And the camera he's got there is not necessarily a professional news camera. And also, I don't know of very many news cameramen who would carry their camera case with them. That's the sign that he's an amateur photographer out there for the day. So we have that, but there's also something else. Notice this gentleman's pocket and what we have in the pocket there. Zooming in on it, it looks like some sort of credential. And so using that fragment of an image, going back and looking at some of the press um, um, insignias of the day, sure does look like a variation of this ABC television network badge, um, which that particular logo was in use by the network from 1957 to 1962. So it's a little out of date by 63, but it's still pretty clearly matches what is in sticking out of that young man's pocket. So again, there's more detail here. We keep pulling out this detail, trying to figure it out, but none of these guys are wearing the very recognizable official press badges that you see uh, designating that they were covering President Kennedy's visit to Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. So who are these five guys? Well, with the ABC badge, the, uh, uh, Malcolm, the Malcolm Kilduff identity, seeing the motorcade from a high angle, this is all starting to seem familiar to me because of the oral history project. So, we don't know who these five guys are. Let's take a moment and watch a quick video and meet the boys of W.W. Samuel High School in Dallas and see if we can solve this mystery. We were working on a, we all had to do a paper uh, on subversive organizations in the United States. And uh, Charles, I, I, it was probably Charles, but it could have been Will, uh, wrote a, a note to the principal through the school saying, listen, we're in this advanced class with problems in democracy. Uh, there's a lot of things happening in the world. Charles was always more political than I was. And uh, David and Courtney and Will and I are great students, and we want to go down and see the president and see if we can take pictures at Love Field that support our premise that there are subversive organizations, even in Dallas, Texas. I borrowed a camera from a, uh, none of us had the cameras except the, you know, the famous Brownie Instamatics or something maybe, and I borrowed a camera from a high school teacher, a Canon um, single reflex lens camera that actually required focusing and all that, and I, I actually had never operated one of those, so he had to teach me how to use it, um, and of course, um, there wasn't really a lot of color film, so it was black and white film. And, and so I, we all carted off and drove off to Love Field that morning. They were so beautiful. And I just, I just thought to myself, man, these are special people. Uh, we were so happy uh, with what happened at the airport that we wanted more of it. We wanted to see them again. So uh, somebody decided, I don't know who, I'll give Will and Charles credit, because uh, I was just kind of dumb and, you know, followed along. They they knew that the president was going to Market Hall, and so uh, they said, why don't we just cut across Dallas and go from Love Field over to Market Hall and find a place where the president will come and we can see the president again. And they came off uh, the motorcade, or what was what was of the motorcade, uh, as I recall, was several um, police uh, motorcycles, um, probably four or five cars total, maybe four cars, a couple of lead cars, uh, the president's open limousine, and then a, and an open car behind it, as I recall. Um, and Mike, t we actually took a picture, Mike actually took it inside of the limousine as it came off. And, they came off at a rather high rate of speed and uh, went right through the intersection. Didn't stop, didn't slow down, just sirens blaring and, and, and took off. And everybody was prone in the seats. Um, you actually couldn't see, but actually see inside, you actually couldn't see um, President Kennedy because his lap, his head was in her lap and she was bent over. We decided we would go to Parkland Hospital. And, and somehow, while we were standing there, Charles mentioned that we had taken this picture of the car, and there was a, a guy behind us from the Associated Press, and he said to Charles, I'll give you 125 bucks sight unseen for that roll of film, and I'll send you the pictures. Well, 
you know, doesn't sound like much now, but for a 17, 18 year old high school kid in 1963, 125 bucks was a lot of money. So, so we talked it over and told Charles do the deal. So we did. This is kind of a weird thing, but I used to work on the sidelines for the ABC affiliate here, WFAA, for the Dallas Texans football game. I used to help a cameraman. His name was Curly Davis, and I would pick his cable up and make sure he could move his camera back and forth. And after one game, I looked in the ground, and in the mud was one of those placards they put on a microphone that says ABC or something. So I picked it up and took it home, and I took the clip off of it. And for some reason, I put that in my pocket that day when we went to go see the president and figured out, you know, who knows, maybe we can get up closer or something like that. So I, I told Charles, come on with me. And so we went right in the door next to the car, and the policeman stopped, and we just showed him that, and we went right in. Now, we didn't get into the trauma rooms where he's being treated, but we ended up in a, a classroom area uh, that they began converting to a press room. All right. So it's with great pride that I can say that when we get the picture back up here, we now know who these guys are. We know their names. Charles Hodges, David Wallace, Will O'Hara, Mike Cargill, and Ronnie Cantrell. And that is thanks to photographic evidence and the oral history collection. It's, it's, it's wonderful in a situation like the Kennedy assassination to be able to say we've at least solved one tiny little mystery. Um, but you know, what does this all mean? Why do we go to such lengths to try to discover the identity of these individuals? It's because of what we just listened to, the rich stories that these folks can tell so many years later to bring us closer to the subject, providing us a tangible link to the moment and the memory of the Kennedy assassination. So these boys from W.W. Samuel High School have a remarkable story to share, which is played out in the photographs of the Dallas Morning News. And W.W. Samuel has such a unique series of connections to the assassination story. There was a young lady, a W.W. Samuel student named Rosemary Simmons, who was out at Love Field that day, and we did an oral history with her. She had the chance to shake President Kennedy's hand, and in this remarkable picture, you can actually see her sort of pushing her hand through the crowd there for her chance to shake President Kennedy's hand, an extraordinary thing. And we have another W.W. Samuel connection here, this wonderful prom photo, which is in our collection, uh, which is actually a recent donation earlier this year, actually just a month or so ago. And what does this prom photo have to do with the Kennedy assassination? Well, the young man in this picture is John Paul Fuller. This is his senior prom image uh, from after the assassination from 1964. Now, at the time, Paul worked for Western Union delivering telegrams, uh, and he operated out of the Main Street. And so he knew Dallas City Hall very well. And so using, uh, wearing his school clothes, but having his tiny little Western Union identification badge, Paul was able to access the third floor of the Homicide and Robbery Division of the Dallas Police Department and get right up there where the action was, peeking in the window of the Homicide and Robbery doorway while Oswald was being interrogated. Uh, he's in this scene somewhere. It's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint him. But, but Paul has this unique connection as a high school student gaining access to the key uh, area where the investigation was taking place that day. But it doesn't end there. The uh, young lady who was his 1963-64 prom date uh, who looks so beautiful and Jacqueline Kennedy-esque in this picture, because, of course, Jacqueline Kennedy certainly uh, influenced fashion and hairstyles of the day. She looks a little like Peggy Olson from Mad Men, you know, but she's not. That is actually Barbara Bentley, the daughter of Detective Paul Bentley, one of the arresting officers of Lee Harvey Oswald. That is Paul chomping that cigar in this photograph. So Paul took Barbara Bentley to the prom, uh, right after the Kennedy assassination. And it's, it's little anecdotal stories like this that aren't recorded anywhere else, but they do provide such a colorful and unique perspective on all these little moments, all these little personalities in the Kennedy assassination story. Now, Paul is here today. Where are you, Paul? Paul, stand up so we can thank you for your prom photo donation. Come on, come on up here. Um, now, I have to ask you, Paul, as a high school student working for Western Union, just tell us what your high school perspective was of the amazing crowds and the chaos of Dallas Police Headquarters the, the evening of the assassination. Speak directly into the mic. I noticed the one thing I got, if, if anyone here is from Brian Adams, us Samuel boys knew how to work, work a badge. <laughs> so 
we had, uh, I got access to a Western Union badge, which we normally didn't use in delivering telegrams at that time. That was old stuff, but I found one in an office desk and carried it in my pocket in case it would ever come in handy. So that afternoon of the assassination, I left, I didn't come down for the parade because I didn't want to be in the crowds downtown. I stayed in school, and after school, when it was time to come down, of course, Dallas was dead. But I came down, uh, nothing was going on, no telegrams going back and forth. To I, I worked in the Cotton Exchange building, and the telegrams there went to Osaka, Japan, mostly back and forth, and the traffic was just nothing. So I took the badge, went to uh, City Hall, which I was very familiar with the police court, the police area, because of uh, knowing Mr. Bentley. And I clipped the badge on, thought I could get in, and just walked in, walked up and <laughs> walked down the hall. And a badge would get you a lot of places then that people, no one asked any questions about it or uh, any, there was no comments about it at all. So it was a, it was a very interesting thing to uh, come to downtown and be a totally dead place that afternoon. It was just remarkable. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for being here today. We're running, we're running a little, uh, little short on time. There's one other uh, special guest in the audience today who has a remarkable story. Um, we don't have time for much of that remarkable story, but just a brief glimpse. Uh, we have an administrator from Parkland Memorial Hospital who helped to set up that nurse's classroom we just saw in that clip of Malcolm Kilduff, Steve Landrigan. Steve, will you stand up for us and come on up here for a moment? Now, Steve, you are the Assistant Administrator for Professional Services, is that right? That's right. All, All right. right. Briefly tell us about when you learned of the assassination, trying to put together that classroom so quickly for the announcement. We uh, were at lunch. My, uh, you had two other administrators, myself. I was Assistant Administrator. That was before they had fancy titles like President and CEO. You know, <laughs> they're very fancy now. Uh, and. Uh, uh, there was a page for the administrator, and he called the switchboard. We didn't have telephones or anything. It was very, quite a different. And she said, there's an emergency sh gunshot wound en route uh, to, that you need to know about. So we went on downstairs, and uh, we didn't know it was the president until we got down there. And uh, so I went uh, out into the emergency arrival area, and they were uh, at that time taking the president out of the car and putting him on a gurney. That's hospital name for stretchers. <laughs> uh, and uh, the Secret Service man there, his name was Clint Hill, uh, took his jacket off and put it over the president's head because he did not want the president bleeding head shown as they came through a public area. And so we went in directly to the uh, emergency operating room, and the governor was right behind us. And we took the president and we had put him in, in uh, uh, trauma room one, and across the hall was trauma room two, and the governor went in there. And uh, the two doctors, and these were house staff, they hadn't had time to get the other doctors. These were interns, residents, and so forth. The one turned to the other and said, don't forget, we do this every Saturday night. Now, what he meant was, we used to, uh, Saturday night was, was the night when all the people would go out and drink and get drunk and get their guns out and shoot each other. <laughs> and so <laughs> we used to say that there's a called a meeting of the Dallas Knife and Gun Club every Saturday night. <laughs> and it's in the Parkland Emergency Room. <laughs> and so what he was saying is, this may be the president and the governor, but a gunshot wound is a gunshot wound is a gunshot wound. And we treat them all the same. Don't get excited there. And so that was uh, what he said there. Uh, there's so much I, you want to know about the announcement. Uh, so many things went on there that day. Uh, the uh, Malcolm Kilduff, uh, we, who mentioned earlier, yeah. 
who was the assistant press. Uh, uh, Pierre Salinger was the press officer, and he was in Paris, France at that time. And so uh, Malcolm Kilduff came up to me, and by this time uh, we knew the president was dead. The president, when he was brought in, medically speaking, was moribund. Now I'm told that that means the death process had started, it was not over, but it was irreversible. Uh, and so he was dying, but there was enough life in there that they fought like the very Dickens to try to save what was there and to do that. So after he had, had uh, uh, passed away, two things happened. I'll throw in very hurriedly. Uh, uh, Clint Hill uh, came out first, and he said, we need to get a casket. And uh, he said, can you take care of that? I had no idea what I was going to do, but I said, come on, we'll do it. And we went out, and all the telephones were, were absolutely down because so many people. But we had in the administrator's office some private lines. And so on the way up, I stuck my head into the social service office, uh, and I said to Mrs. Dybel, I said, where's the nearest funeral home? And she said, O'Neill's on Oak Lawn. And so, yeah, I said, get me a phone number and, and uh, call me up in the office. So by the time we got up there, uh, he uh, uh, had, we had contacted O'Neill, and I told him who I was and what the situation was. And I said, this is the Secret Service officer. And he got on the phone, he said, I want your best casket, and I want it in five minutes. <laughs> And the guy started asking him questions. He said, no questions. The best you got, and get it the hell here. Right. <laughs> and that's, that was exactly what he said. And so uh, then he said to me this. He said, uh, I, I need to cover my bloody shirt. Uh, it, it, he looked terrible. He said, can I borrow your jacket? So <laughs> I lent him my jacket. Clint Hill. And I never got it back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And um, when he was here two years ago, I reminded him of that. Oh, okay. But you asked him. Yeah. The press room, Malcolm Kilduff said, we've got to get a press room. And I said, there's only two places. That's a, a double classroom. And we went up to the double classroom, and he led the press corps around the outside. And the, one of the other administrators had contacted the... Uh, uh, telephone company, and St. Paul Hospital was a month away from opening. They had all the lines and everything hooked up, and they were the same system as ours. So they brought all the phones from Parkland and plugged them in in those classrooms. So we had plenty of phones for the press to use. Uh, so that was the story of the classrooms, and then I participated in the uh, uh, in the press conferences too. My oral, uh, we've done two oral histories with Steve Landrigan that total, I think, over three hours of content because this yeah. man is full of stories and history. Thank you so much, Steve, for being here today. Uh, in, in so many ways, this has been a tremendous year in, in gathering uh, films, photographs, and oral histories. But as we, as we end the program today, I, I want to leave it on a contemplative note because it's been a tragic year in another way because we've lost so many of our oral history storytellers. Uh, Twenty, in fact, passed away this year who gave interviews to the museum. And uh, we want to do a, a brief little tribute to those, those storytellers who aren't with us anymore uh, as, we, as we conclude our program today. I knew there were thousands of people, plain people, ordinary folks, who loved John F. Kennedy. So I uh, imposed upon the others and I said, look, in my hometown, I want a public meeting. I want a meeting out there, just we can go right outside the Texas hotel where he'll be spending the night. We will assemble the crowd in that big parking lot out there. So we set an early morning appearance to which Kennedy readily agreed. We saw the president's plane coming into Love Field from Fort Worth. And I said, I've never seen a president. My real recollection immediately and afterwards and later as I think of it was I was utterly drawn to the pink suit and the incredible glamour of the look. We turned the corner off of Maine on to Houston. 
and they had, traffic had to slow up to make the turn to go on to Elm Street. Well, I pulled over next to the curb, in the curb lane, waiting for them to get around the corner. And I'm sitting there right straight across from the door going into the county jail when the shots were fired. Well, they were down here on Elm Street at that time. I looked up. And all I saw was the pigeons flying out from behind that school book depository. So the minute the motorcade uh, made the turn off of Maine, I had my three boys to start waving. They were all three waving at that time. Now, when the shots went off, my middle son stopped waving. And I knew I was looking back towards the triple underpass. And the minute that motorcade came in, my, my original plan was the minute it came in view was to start filming and it turned out I didn't start until they just about were exiting out of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. But that of course followed after all the shots went off and people were falling and running down on the ground we could see through there. Went back up toward the the, uh, the entrance of the trademark and we heard sirens and I went up to the detective and I said, I hear sirens, I said, what's going wrong? He says, something's happened downtown. He says, I think the president got hit. And I said, what, with an egg, a rock, you know? Back in those days, it was Two or three people around town didn't care that much for the president, but uh, he said, he may be more serious than that. He said, I can't tell from the radio. And, uh, we ran back over to where that detective was and said, hey, can you take us to Parkland? I think they're going to Parkland. He says, I know they're going to Parkland. Somebody's fired some shots out there downtown, so he, he took us to Parkland. And when uh, Ruby was filed on for murder, he became a county prisoner, so he had at least a month sitting with Jack Ruby eight hours a day, what we call babysitting Ruby, to make sure that nothing happened to Ruby. Ruby was a very high-strung individual. We talked about a lot, a lot of hours of talking. Uh, Ruby never gave up his desire to make money. Uh, he tried to get me to go in business with him, and here I'm, I'm a young man who wasn't really interested in going in business. Uh, Jack was emotionally disturbed. Uh, Jack was an emotionally disturbed person, in my opinion. He would talk a while, and then he'd cry and said, I don't want to talk anymore. When he'd say that, I'd, we'd sit there, and a little bit he'd get composed, and he'd volunteer, start talking again, and when he started talking, I'd ask him questions. And that went on all afternoon, but. It was obvious to me that Jack was an emotionally disturbed person. I got the impression that Ruby was a sort of a ne'er-do-well who always wanted to be a big shot. And he never was successful at anything particularly. And uh, he was quite disappointed in himself, but he, he wanted to be a very important person. And he never achieved that to, uh, to his belief. The Kennedys were admired, and um, the whole city was in a state of shock when, when the assassination happened. And uh, I heard uh, the um, uh, the as assassination on the radio. It was a terrible thing uh, for uh, Dallas, and uh, I think that it um, was something that we uh, dealt with for a long time after the happening. It's probably one of the worst experiences other than any than Dr. King's assassination. Uh, this might have been more powerful because I felt closer to, uh, to Kennedy and all that he stood for. He was like a fresh breath of air for me at, at that stage in my life. I noticed he was able to speak up, you know, when they were marching down there in Alabama and Georgia and so forth. He would speak up in, in, in the behalf of the people that were marching in those days when, when no other white office, people in office were able to say anything in their behalf, you know. But Kennedy, he was able to speak up.
at least 500 years from now, people will at least be able to see the films and photographs. They'll still be around, or the latest digitized version of them will, will still be around. That makes me feel good. Moments and memories, that's what it's all about. And I hope those of you who have your own memories of President Kennedy, the assassination, the aftermath, the 1960s, will share those rich stories with us. We have a, a book of, of uh, contact information just outside the main uh, gallery here by the elevators. Please sign up with your email, your phone number, and volunteer for an in-person video interview or a telephone interview. Add your story to this tapestry of living history. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation t t today. Uh, I thought that um, uh, it, was, it was a fantastic way of sharing some films and photos, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Thank you, folks, very much for being here.